Hi everyone, I'm Nikhil and today's topic is, like my topic is about securing smart contracts using automated tools. What's different with smart contracts? Like smart contracts are immutable, which means that once you deploy the code, the deployed code cannot be changed. But people can circ circumvent this by using proxy pattern, but it's usually not advisable to like continuously keep switching your code like once a month or something because it sort of violates the principle of like blockchain, right? And it has to be immutable. And it's sort of suspicious that if the frequency of updating the contract is like extremely high. And the second difference is that everything's visible. Like if a hacker wants to hack your smart contract, then he can look at everything, ranging from the storage values and the code and everything. And yeah, one of the no novice ways to secure smart contracts is that people think that smart contracts cannot be hacked if, if they are not like, if the source code is not available anywhere. But there are lots of cases where like hacks happen by solely by using bytecode. That's because decompilers are extremely good. Like this is, a, this is an example of the output of the decompiler, which is on the right side. And the left side is the program to which the decompiler's output corresponds to. We can easily understand what's in the decompiler. It's the if condition is denotes the function call and var zero is the function signature for comment scaling. And the if else condition sort of denotes the required statement and storage zero x zero zero is the e scalable Boolean value. So it's fairly easy to understand that what's happening solely by looking at the decompiler's output. And the second novice way, I would rather call it a catastrophic way, is by using obfuscation. People think that if you cannot understand the code, it's not hackable, but that's usually not the case because automated tools do not care what you name the functions as. Like let's, call, let's say if you call your functions as like cheeseburgers or whatever, it doesn't matter. Like tools can just like try to find, try to extract Ethereum from your contract. Like this is a classic example of like how people obfuscate. Like if you have names like dog.sol, cat.sol or whatever and contract names such as cheeseburgers or something like that, it's pretty hard to understand what's happening. But, and it's also pretty hard for an auditor to understand like what, uh, what, what was your intention to write some XYZ code. And this makes audits much harder because the auditor might spend half of his allotted time trying to understand why you are adding cheeseburgers with Cheetos or something like that. So it's usually not advisable to obfuscate the code unless you have some cool tool that can obfuscate automatically by preserving the equivalence across the programs. And even if you want to obfuscate, do it after the audit process because it's our auditor has to understand what your intention is for writing code. And yeah, steps to secure smart contracts. The first step, first important step is to write clear code, uh, which is fairly obvious. And the second, but the more important step is that you have to label every possible program property. This is because bugs happen when what you think, like the specification in your mind does not match with what you write. And one way to handle this is to list out every possible program property and try to check whether the code that you write satisfies this property. And this is an example of a program property, like consider the classic transfer function and you don't have to care like what's inside, just assume it's a classic transfer function. And transfer functions usually have to satisfy properties such as the sum of the balances before the execution of the transfer function should be same as the sum of balances after the execution. I mean, that's the property that most transfer functions satisfy. And the second, like the other properties are like, once the tra transfer executes, then the receiver gains like value amount of tokens and the sender loses value amount of tokens. And one way to annotate these program properties is by using assertions, but it gets a bit messy because you are changing the code, right? And this can be a bit problematic. The other much cleaner way is to use instrumentation tools such as Scribble. And this is how like instrumentation with Scribble works. You can just annotate a program property with comments 
like in this case it's um, like in the comments the if succeeds keyword denotes that if the transfer from transaction succeeds then the following condition holds which is the some old balance plus old balance of the sender plus receiver is same as the new balance of sender plus receiver it's basically the uh, balance sum invariant and once you have such an annotation you can directly run scribble and it auto generates the assertions for you and for more information about scribble you can check the github link And the third and third step is to use automated tools to find potential bugs. Like once you have the assertions ready with the step two, all you have to do is to like try to use automated tools to break these assertions. Like the two classic methods of like breaking assertions is by using fuzzers, and the second would be the symbolic execution engines. Fuzzers try to like auto generate random inputs and break these try break these assertions while symbolic execution engines try to use symbolic inputs to generate some constraint and solve this constraint to break the assertions and in this talk i'll discuss about symbolic execution engines yeah consider this program like comment scaling and in this in this function call like symbolic execution engine assumes the inputs as symbolic in this case kill and kill code and then the function gets executed. In this case, there are two different possible program states. The first state is when the required satisfies. And when the required satisfies, it leads to the self-destruction. And if the required fails, then we, we head to the revert program state. What these symbolic execution engines do is that they try to, like, let's say the self-destruct is an interesting property, right? Like, if any random guy can self-destruct your contract, it's catastrophic. So one way to check this is that uh, symbolic execution engines can like have con like can construct symbolic constraints to reach a program property, like self-destruct in this case. And then we append the self-destruct, the constraint for self-destruction, where the message dot sender equals unaffiliate, some unaffiliated address. If such a constraint is satisfied, that means that some any random guy can like self-destruct your contract. And Mithril is one of the symbolic execution engines, and it's fairly easy to install. It's also fairly easy to run. Like, it's just myth-analyze file name and transaction count, whatever it is, yeah. And if your file has some external dependencies, you'll have to use a Solidity JSON file to, like, map these, map all the file paths, like, opens up the libraries, etc. And just this is again an example of like what what's the output of Mithril? Like uh, the unprotected self-destruct is the vulnerability, and then we have the, then we have the yeah then we have the file name and the location of the bug, and also a transaction sequence that that's used to generate reproduce this bug. Uh, the, uh, Mithril's transaction sequences work in this way, like. First, it's, we start with an initial state, and then it executes the constructor. And with this, like we have three possible functions, right? In this case, killerize, activate, and kill. And then, in the sec first transaction, it executes all it executes all the three possible functions. And in the second transaction, there are like three more possible functions, right? So it's like three square. And if there are three transactions, it will be like three party. But like Mithril has a few optimizations where it prunes a lot of useless states. And with this, like, although it's still exponential, it's like much lower than three party. And with Mithril, you can also constrain some transaction sequences. Let's say if you are interested in finding, like in your third transaction, if you want to find whether a program property holds, then all you have to do is to like, write the function signature in the final transaction. Like, you can also write a list of function signatures in the transaction. Like, if, if there's an empty list that denotes that this transaction is not constrained. So in this case, the first two transactions are unconstrained, and the third transaction is constrained with the following function signature. And Mithril has additional features such as 
a, a symbolic execution with a symbolic initial state. And with Mithril, you can also run it on deployed contracts on, with, which uses on-chain storage. So like for some reason, a lot of people on Discord actually use the second feature. They claim that they are using it for research purposes, but yeah, let's stick with it. And the final, final step is to get a security audit because nothing's going to like beat a security audit as auditors are trained to understand, uh, effectively find the bugs. And the step two is also essential because like if you perfectly annotate the program properties, then auditors will have a better time understanding what your intention for writing the code is. So they'll have a better time auditing it and you'll get a much better improved report of what the, the security issues in your program. And yeah, these are the resources. Like if you, if you have any questions about Mithril, then you can just log an issue in the Mithril's GitHub repo. And if you have issues about Scribble, then you can log, log an issue in Scribble's GitHub repo. And that's my email. And do you have any questions? Yeah, I think that's it.